Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on the Team Avalanche HR podcast from Nittany Line Station, located in State College, PA. We hope everyone is able to gain some valuable insight from our reports on current and various controversial topics surrounding the HR industry. This is Evan Hirsch, and I am excited to be traveling when the pandemic is over. My name is Chris Dorenzo, and I'm a senior at Penn State majoring in hospitality management. One of my favorite topics of conversation is sports. Hi, I'm Dean Posner, and I'm a senior studying hospitality, and I like to go fishing in my free time. Hey, my name is Alexis Slaughter, and I'm a senior majoring in hospitality management. Thanks, Alexis. My name is Rob Lane, and I'm a senior in professional golf management. For today's podcast, we will be discussing the impacts of COVID in the workplace and touch on how to have mindfulness during the pandemic. Now, without further ado, let's get started with the news. This is Evan Hirsch again with HR from Happy Valley, and I'm going to start off today's podcast with reporting from Here's Something Important Desk. What could be so important? Your salaries, that's what. The story I'd like to share with you is from the February 4th issue of the HR Dive entitled Coronavirus Pandemic Fuels Fair Pay Concerns. It highlights some key points about wage transparency that have surfaced during the pandemic. New surveys have revealed that employees are thinking more about their salaries and comparing their wages while with other workers in similar positions around the country. This comparison has revealed new concerns about fair pay. According to key statistics in the article, one third of the workers surveyed said their earnings have been severely impacted by the pandemic and they think about their salaries more than they did in 2019. In 2021, employees want a clearer picture of what they are earning. The article reports that a large percentage of employees expected to continue to research to see if their fair pay is in comparison within the industry. Race has been a huge factor entering into the fair pay disclosures with black workers finding more discrimination than other populations. What you might find interesting about this story is that the survey has stressed that while employees are questioning their pay and attempting to assess whether or not they are getting paid competitively, they are hesitant to disclose their salaries to others. This makes it difficult for them to compare and contrast their wages with their peers. If more transparency could be encouraged, then workers could determine a salary range for their job description. With that in mind, Managers who support fair pay policies should be unafraid to encourage their employees to discuss their salaries with others. If managers are playing fair, then this ethic will allow them to avoid future charges of discrimination in the future. And now, on to Chris at the Here's Something Cool desk. Thanks, Evan. I'm Chris Durante reporting live from the Here's Something Cool desk with HR from Happy Valley. Are you, are you sick of doing everything virtually? Well, 2020 recruiting trends are here to stay in 2021. This is an article published on February 1st titled 2021 Recruiting Trends Shaped by the Pandemic from the HRM website. This article is based on a survey conducted through LinkedIn. Over 1,500 professionals participated in this survey and 70% claim that virtual hiring is here to stay. One thing I found cool is how everyone has adapted to the remote lifestyle so fast and efficiently. Recruiters are rapidly adding skills like bringing clarity to talent data, reshaping employer branding, and fine tuning the virtual hiring process. This is good because we are adding new ways of learning and adapting in the HR industry that will continue to affect our recruiting process for years to come. Now, many people may not find this cool because we want to get back to face-to-face interactions. But there are many advantages of recruiting virtually. Virtual hiring allows recruiters to improve diversity hiring by being able to meet with all different people from around the world while both staying at their current locations. Being able to interview from many different geographic locations can improve not only the diversity of your workplace, but also better the talent of the employees being hired. Managers should continue to adapt to these new trends and use them to bid on their current recruiting strategies. All right, and now on to Dean with current events on Here's Something Innovative Desk. Hi everyone, my name is Dean Posner reporting live from Happy Valley. I'll be keeping us going at the Here's Something Innovative Desk. What do you think will be more efficient in the workplace in five to 10 years? Humans or robots? This story from a February 2021 article off HR Drive titled, IBM adds AI powered tools to support return to work operations will have you questioning the impact robots can have in the workplace. 
some really special and innovative things are going on at IBM. They're rolling out an app that you can pull up on your phone that shows a map of your office and you can see where your fellow employees are in the office because the app can detect heat signatures. You can see if you are properly social distancing and you can stay away from crowded areas around the office. They're also rolling out an interactive chat bot in which you can ask questions and request to book rooms. It will properly keep track of room schedules and book rooms for meetings, as well as leave a 10 to 15 minute window in between meetings to send someone who can clean and sanitize the rooms between use. I feel like these new features should help manage COVID-19 worries in the workplace. IBM took a very advanced and technological approach to returning to work, and I'm curious to see how other companies will manage returning to work and keeping employees safe. All right, and now on to Alexis for here's something to think about. Thanks, Dean. What does it mean to stimulate your mind? Year 2020 brought many challenges. My name is Alexis Slaughter, reporting from Here's Something to Think About Desk. Any mentally stimulating activity can help build the brain. A strong mind is open to what it doesn't know, and a weak mind is open to what it does know. Many challenges, many changes have been made due to the pandemic. There's always something to think about. The article is named Yale's Most Popular Course Ever Teaches the Science of Being Help Happy is available for free online. It was published in January during 2021 by Fast Company. It discusses how the pandemic has made a negative impact on mental health due to the social distancing and isolation. The online course is available to everyone. The course helps improve mental health and behavior change by giving small homework assignments that focus on positivity. The course became popular and created a positive outcome for many students. Many students have started a new career became more productive and increased their happiness after taking the course. The skills are very beneficial and needed during times like this. I thought the course was brilliant and thoughtful idea. Two out of three workers suffer from mental health, a combination of long work hours, high pressure environment, and poor work life, work life balance creates stress. Due to the pandemic, lives will forever be changed. COVID-19 was highly unexpected. The hospitality industry needs to promote mental health in the workplace to support their employees. Small things go a long way. Gestures ranging from a hug to paying someone bills can help relieve stress. Many people think of doing grand gestures to show they appreciate a person, but the little things are just as important. It doesn't hurt to spread kindness to help make the world a better place. How can you help others? And now on to Rob, but here's something to look out for desk. Thanks, Alexis. So what if I told you that your commute to work in 2022 can take 10 seconds? I'm not talking about bullet trains or teleportation. I'm talking about working from home. Sure, we have all experienced the repercussions of social distancing in this day and age with countless Zoom meetings and online work. What about after COVID? The article I explored was from January of this year titled The Post-Pandemic Office, Who Returns, Who Works From Home by Sarah Hope from a website called fastcompany.com. The article talks about some, some of the positives and negatives for companies who are stuck online during the pandemic. The piece that I found interesting was that it talks about how the data collected from 2020 regarding working from home has been overwhelmingly positive. People find that it is more, much more convenient for them to work from home, which in turn results in better productivity. So is working from home here to stay post-pandemic? For some, yes. For some, not entirely. And what I mean by not entirely is that a lot of companies have invested money so that their employees can function well remote, remotely during these times. With all this money invested, I think we will start to see more flexible work models and companies for companies that allow remote work to be more common in the article, it even states that companies without remote working capabilities risk becoming laggards, which will hurt their recruiting process. So as we start to see the transition between working at home and being back in person, I would definitely be on the lookout for new policies at your place of employment that allow for more flexibility regarding remote work. Thanks, Rob. So it looks like our common theme is how the pandemic has severely impacted many segments of the HR industry and has brought up new challenges that people are learning to deal with each day. Chris, I really found your article interesting, particularly about how virtual recruiting can increase diversity. Would you say that virtual recruiting is now a more efficient way of recruiting? 
Uh, yes, I mean, I do believe that virtual recruiting is a more efficient way, especially with apps like Zoom and Skype. You can reach anyone at anywhere, anytime. So I do believe it is a lot more efficient. I'm also uh, I'm not surprised that people are focused on their salaries now more than ever. How do you think it will affect employees' performance while at work? I definitely think that this will have a major impact uh, for people at work. Uh, people figuring out their salaries and finding out that it's not as competitive as, as other people in the industry will obviously upset them and it would cause a lot of friction at their place of employment. And so people being able to compare their salaries and figure out who's being paid what is, is an important factor. And I feel like it's important for people to understand and, and for their work productivity um, levels. If their salary is not where it needs to be, their productivity levels will not be where it needs to be as compared to somebody who feels that they're being paid an appropriate salary, their pr work productivity will be where it's expected or exceed where it's expected. Alexis, I really like the idea of teaching the science of, to being happy, especially in these trying times. Do you think some companies will look to maybe implement a program like Yale's course to help improve employees' morale during these hard times? Of course. I believe many companies will impl implement a program like Yale's. They will see the positive impact and begin to follow and expect the same outcome. Hey, Rob, I found it interesting that without remote working capabilities, companies' risk become laggards. Companies invested so much money into adapting to the changes. How would the how would employees be affected by the constant change from going in person to online and back? That's a good question, Alexis. As of right now, there is no real answer. In the article I read, it talks about how before the pandemic, companies were trying to promote on-campus culture. I think we will see companies keep trying to pursue that, but just in a remote way. I expect to see some creative ideas coming from companies that promote social interaction among their employees, regardless of if you are at work or working from home. I actually have a question for Dean. Uh, first of all, the article you chose was really cool, but as companies are starting to shift to AI instead of actual employees, how will HR be affected by that? That's a great question, Rob. I feel like it could help automate repetitive administrative tasks, saving time for other more valuable tasks at hand. We all are in agreement and feel that the pandemic has been influential in creating new challenges for the HR industry, but has yielded now new innovative solutions for workers all around the globe that can become new and effective processes in the industry today in post COVID-19. And now on to hot topics. Thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. My name is Rob Lane from T Team Avalanche. And on today's episode, we'll be debating virtual professionalism and why it is something you need to be aware of in today's world. I'll be playing the role of facilitator today. And before we get started with the debate, I wanna share some interesting information regarding virtual professionalism. According to a Gallup poll, I found 33% of Americans are working remotely, while another 25% are working remotely at least half of the time. This means that over 50% of Americans are working remotely in some capacity, which is a pretty shocking fact, if you ask me. With that being said, let's hear what our debaters are saying about virtual professionalism. I'm going to hand it off to Evan, who will be debating on side one. Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Hirsch, and I'm a side one debater. The first argument that we will be presenting is punctuality. It is an extremely important element in demonstrating virtual professionalism. The pre-meeting elements for success are nearly as important as the meeting itself. Having the virtual meeting set up properly and ready to begin on time sets the tone for the meeting and employees as well as meeting organizers have a responsibility to make this happen. Exactly, Evan. Those are great points. My name is Alexis Slaughter and being punctual is also extremely important for creating a productive meeting space and fostering a good workflow. Technology issues can disrupt the workflow of the meeting and waste time that should and waste time that should be used to get through the meeting material. The Wall Street Journal recommends using one technique to help the functionality. One Cisco marketer recommends locking the door of a meeting of a WebEx video conference five minutes after it starts. Also, a BBC article states that to avoid being, being late. Even if you are on computer time, take a few minutes ahead of the call or party, especially if you are the host, to test your settings and recheck your internet. This helps the preparedness 
for the meeting and minimize any interruptions of the technical problems or delays. That BBC article definitely gives some important tips to make sure that the flow of the meeting goes smoothly. Good points, Alexis. The next argument that we will be presenting is aimed at supporting existing company policies. Maintaining company policies, such as dress codes, deadlines, sexual harassment policies, is critical, even though you are not physically in the office. For example, dressing business casual at the minimum is important for maintaining virtual professionalism. You are still a part of the company and must represent its image as well as convey your own professionalism. Representing the company's image as well as your own is a vital part in displaying virtual professionalism for clients or guests. According to a SEE article, it is also important to remember existing company policies that may still apply to work days, even though you may not be physically located at an office or on company property. Also, the same SEE article mentions, although you are not in the same place as your coworkers, prospects, and clients, you should still represent yourself and your business well with your appearance. Lastly, treatment of clients and guests is especially important for proper virtual professionalism. A monster article states, etiquette now is focused on being authentic and relatable. You want people to choose to be around you and do business with you. And quite simply, people want to do business with people they like. Hey Dean, what's your argument? My name is Dean Posner, and my first argument is about good meetings and efficient results. We know that good meetings are the ones that have the best outcomes and engagement. This is shown when people are researching, taking notes, and generating ideas, all while somewhat listening to the presenter to help fill in the gaps and make these ideas a reality. In Zoom meetings today, people are just sitting there and acting like they are paying attention and adding nothing because it makes you look like you are actually being engaging when in reality you are not. Hi, I'm Chris and I completely agree, Dean. At Penn State, some of our professors require the whole class to have their cameras on. However, I often catch myself zoned out staring at the screen instead of actually taking notes just because I want the professor to see I'm paying attention. In the article, Why Smart Bosses Let Employees Turn Off Their Cameras During Zoom by Jeff Hayden from inc.com, a LinkedIn poll was conducted asking if employees were required to keep their cameras on while being on Zoom. 90% of these respondents said that they were required to have their cameras on. What bosses aren't aware of is how this affects the performance of their employees. Instead of having just one person as the focus of the group, there are many, which leads to distract, distractions and a pressure to perform. Another example where there's pressure to perform in online meetings is when it comes to responding quickly. There was a study conducted by the International Journal of Human Computer Studies, and they found that delays in answers of 1.2 seconds made the speaker seem less attentive, friendly, and disciplined than if a delay wasn't experienced. That is an extremely short time to be pressured to answer when companies could be talking about very big important issues during a meeting. Do you really want someone to make a decision for your company that they were pressured into and only thought up to thought about for up to 1.2 seconds? Exactly, Dean. Not only does having everyone's camera on make people feel pressured to perform, there's also a huge distraction as well. Now that most people are working from home, it is hard to control how professional you can be. At home, people have kids, spouses, pets, and other distractions that could be going on in the background of their videos and Zoom calls. Having a lot of background distractions can affect both the presenter and listeners. When you can see everything going on in people's backgrounds, it can be hard to not get distracted and lose your train of thought. Going from back-to-back -back meetings over Zoom has a negative physical and psychological effect on our bodies that we don't even realize. In person, we can move between meetings and have small interactions with employees that help relieve pressures. Now we are just sitting there for hours, not moving, having these less realistic interactions online, and it's putting pressure on how we act in front of the camera and is taking away from our physical and psychological health, making work results less efficient. By 2025, 75% of global workplaces will be made up of millennials. Companies including Ernst & Young and Accenture already have reported that millennials make up two thirds of their employee base already. This means that the workplace will shift its norms and standards to conform with the majority of its workforce. Good manners in meetings keep changing, and it's not about looking professional and saying please and thank you anymore. It's more about people being comfortable with you, especially over these virtual settings. So if that means by doing your work in sweatpants at your house, then that is okay, because it will help you be more open and make meaningful, lasting relationships with other people and clients. 
Thank you, uh, debaters. Those were some interesting points there that you guys uh, provided us with. But uh, before we end things here, I'd like to uh, have a little discussion panel, uh, and I'll start it off. Uh, the first question is, for both sides, can you tell me more about how your argument increases happiness in the workplace? Well, there is a reason that tailored jackets are known for being dressed with success. You dress how you feel. The clothes you wear affects your behavior, such as your mood, confidence, and attitude. You may even want to socialize more as you build confidence. Wearing professional clothing makes you feel good and helps you become better abstract thinkers in negotiating. This is Chris again from side two. And I think reducing how strict we are with virtual professionalism makes for happier employees, especially during the current situation we are in. Allowing employees to be comfortable while working from their house is the least bosses could do right now. This is Evan again from side one. And Dean, I wanted to uh, make a point about your point uh, about pressure and that employees shouldn't have to sit on meetings with their cameras on is valid. However, have you considered having meetings with clients or customers where they would want to see your face? Wouldn't you want to be dressed professionally and be presentable for your organization? I agree. I think when you're working with clients and customers, you should be dressed appropriately. But if you're just working day to day with people you know in the office, I feel like it's less important. On side two, um, Evan, your point on maintaining existing company policies is a very respectable view. However, now that we have moved to virtual and everyone is dealing with different issues on a day-to-day -day basis, isn't it easier to adapt company policies and loosen them up if, it, if efficient work is being produced? I agree and completely understand that that could definitely be a possibility that could help uh, benefit employees. However, important company policies such as sexual harassment and if a dress code is, is uh, put in place are important policies that can't be loosened as both pertain to the success of the organization and its employees. Thanks for that, Evan. Um, unfortunately, it looks like we're running out of time. So I first want to thank our debaters for participating today. You all made some great points on the topic. I know virtual professionalism can be a hard topic to debate, but I found both of their sides to be very interesting. Virtual professionalism can certainly, uh, certainly continues to be a hot topic in today's world, and we're all very curious to see how it continues to develop in the HR world. For now, hopefully everyone learned a little more about virtual professionalism today. I know I certainly did. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have today. Uh, but we hope you'll tune in with us again soon. We would love uh, to hear what you have to say about all these questions. We think we thought these were very insightful questions that provoke a lot of thought, especially during the time of the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first one is, that I'm going to answer is, uh, to what extent do you think companies are doing a good job promoting work-life balance? What can companies do to uh, better restore balance in employees' lives? So this is something that like I I hold like near and dear to my heart is work-life balance because it's something that's like so rare to find truly. Um, my first job within Marriott, I was in the Voyager program and I, uh, you know, I struggled to find that work-life balance. You're just so anxious to get out there and like just whatever anyone says, you just say, yes, you just do it. So you just want to make a good impression. And I definitely felt myself getting burnt out. Um, you just, I, I was working overnight shifts. I was doing 12 hour shifts. I was, you know, like 60, 70 hours a week sometimes. And um, so after that, I realized like, there's just no way I can keep that up. And, you know, um, it's important to, to let your boss know when you think you're at your capacity, J just like be cognizant is the amount I'm working deteriorating my ability to perform in my job. And if that's the case, then, you know, you need to, to be honest and say like, I'm, you know, I'm, here to perform at a high level and I and in order to do so adjustments need to be made um I think from like a company perspective what they could do you know it, it just depends like hospitality has so much turnover and because of that you do end up with a lot of short staff departments I think if you focus on retaining more employees you just find yourself in situations where work-life balance is more achievable and that's that's really the the case is like it all comes down to, uh, you know, your hiring practices and making sure that you're getting good people and treating them well and making sure they stay. And Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I totally agree with you. That's a fantastic point you just made. I mean, work-life balance is so essential to kind of reaching your peak productivity. And mm -hmm. just like you said before, it's really important to kind of let your manager, your boss know, you know, if, if you're being overworked. Yeah, I actually have a question regarding the question you just answered. 
I'm in the golf industry and obviously I'm in the same boat as you are with the amount of hours that I work and everything like that. Do you think we can see like in the hospitality uh, industry, a decrease in the amount of employees that we're getting? Cause so many other industries are, you know, offering that great home or work-life balance. Yeah. I, it's a great question. I, I don't necessarily know what, what the future holds for hospitality because it's undergoing a transition period right now that's going to end up with an ultimately more stable version of what it was. I think the positions are always going to be there. There's always people to hire. I, I think it's going to rebound well. There's a ton of like really, really talented people that have been laid off, furloughed, whatever. And there's just going to be a reshuffling of where those talented individuals go. You know, If you're back to full capacity, you've got to be back to full staffing. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So uh, selecting the right employee is a fundamental first step in creating a great work, uh, workplace. What's the biggest hiring mistakes you've seen? Uh, how do you think companies can do a better job of hiring employees you fit? Think that it's huge, especially in hospitality. You know, you're, you're short like three people. You're not going to take your time. You're like stressed out. You're just, they're just trying to hire a warm body sometimes. And I've seen it. And I think that's a huge mistake. Uh, Dr. Chu's actually mentioned it a ton when I was in his class. You know, you take your time to hire and like, you don't, you have a short leash when it comes to, to messing up. It's, it's hard because it's on an individual basis. Like, um, I think a big part of it needs to be obviously your ability to do the job. And another big part is like how you fit on the team. I think like hospitality is more than a lot of industries, like very team-based. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, to follow up with that, Jacob. So we're all seniors getting ready to graduate school and getting into the whole interview process for real jobs or anything. Is there just anything you would have done different that you wish you would have done? I was in a good situation when I graduated. I had two job offers by Thanksgiving. The job market was really good. I had the job with Marriott and the, and the job with MGM to pick from. So like, I guess I would have continued to look past Thanksgiving of my senior year, just learn about more companies. So that way, like if I did want to transition away from Marriott or I would have had contacts already, you know, never be afraid to work your, your network. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. I, uh, I have another question going back to recruiting. I know you're on the recruiting side of things. Um, in class, we talk about uh, types of recruitment methods, you know, when it comes to employee referral programs, um, online postings through LinkedIn and things like that. What are like your top three go-to recruiting methods and how do you use them in your day-to-day -day work? Great question. I am a contract-based recruiter for, you know, Salesforce developers, assistant administrators, stuff like that. So like I could be hiring for like, a job that might only be for 10 hours. Someone's just like, I need a developer for 10 hours to come in and fix my code. So I work a with a lot of repeat people like um, to come in and do work. And then I'll, I'll use LinkedIn a lot. I use like uh, LinkedIn recruiter. I do post some jobs on LinkedIn. Um, and through that, I'll, you know, people will send me emails and like, you know, they'll send me the resume and I'll give them a call and do what's called like a qualification call. And then you know, in the course of 30 minutes, I basically get a baseline understanding of their skill set and place them in jobs. Like half my job is calling businesses, trying to solicit business, and then the other half is calling candidates. Absolutely. Thank you. So how important do you think your first job is like straight after you graduate? It's, it's super, super important for getting your feet wet in professional, the professional world. You might have had a, a job or an internship, but this is the first time where you're really like starting a job. It's going to be 40 hours a week with no end in sight. It's, it's really good to like get professional communication and like how to talk to managers and how to like actually do your job. It can be incredibly formative if you have like a good team and a mentor and a manager that you like and stuff like that. Or it could just be like how you like establish your baseline professional abilities. I went from operations to accounting and now I'm in recruiting. Like <laughs> my, my first job gave me a good toolkit to use, just how to deal with crazy things. Like, it, you know, it, it just increases your stress tolerance. But like, that's, that's like the main thing I took away from that job. That and a bunch of friends, you know, so friends that text me and stuff from my first hotel. But yeah, no, I, I don't think you should, uh, like anyone should be too worried. The company you're with first isn't, isn't, is usually not going to be the company you finish with. You might, you know, take a crazy path. It's not like, uh, like the 1950s where like you start a job at like 22 and retire there at 65 and, you know, they give you a little plaque or something. 
Uh, Jacob, I kind of wanted to circle back a little bit, um, kind of to what Dean uh, was talking about, different recruitment methods and uh, HR policies. I wanted to ask you uh, something about performance appraisals, because that's something that we've recently started talking about in class. Some employees ha our employers have eliminated formal uh, performance appraisals. And so do you think that formal appraisal, uh, formal appraisals should stay or should companies get rid of them? I think it's nice to get one if you have a like distant relationship with your manager where you're not kind of told how you're doing every day. Like I'm close with my manager right now and he'll tell me every single day, like twice a day, like we'll talk and I'll be like, okay, good, good first half of the day, bad first half of the day. You did this wrong. You should do this better. Like, it's just, so I don't need a, a formal appraisal because I'm getting yeah. constant feedback and that helps me, you know, like, like pivot. In some old jobs, you know, I might be talking to my director of operations like once a week, once every other week. And, you know, in that case, I'm not, I, I don't know how I'm doing necessarily. So it's, I needed those like formal sit downs to, to get an idea of if they were happy with me or not happy with me. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Can I, I'm just going to circle back to what Dean said again about uh, the hiring process. I wanted to get your opinion on this. Do you hire or recruit people based on if you see yourself working with them or more so their, you know, like job experience? Because um, personally, I would kind of want to want someone that can do both, uh, someone that I can get along with and someone that's good. So just wanted to get your opinion on that. Yeah. So I would absolutely hire for people that I want to work with if I wasn't doing the type of recruiting that I am doing. Yeah. If I was recruiting for hotels, yeah, yeah, like absolutely. Like more than anything, more than what you've done, I'm looking to see like, will you fit in? Like, cause the, the work itself isn't incredibly like challenging or complex. I'd be more evaluating someone on that. How well are you gonna take criticism or like handle someone yelling at you? And like, how are you gonna like get along with the team? Like, are you gonna go out for like dinner and a drink after or something like that? And like like be friends because that, that contributes a lot to the longevity of your time with a company. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the, uh, the best teams that I've experienced in the golf industry, some of the people that I've worked for, um, all of us have clicked. And uh, I think that's important for any type of um, hospitality team. Absolutely. Um, so I guess uh, circling back and just wrapping up, uh, I guess the last thing that we can ask you is going based off what you just said is how to not make it bad, especially during these difficult times. It's, it's been tough working virtually, you know, the, the mental health of everyone's been all over the place. And so how would you kind of make the work environment more fun during times like this? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, it's important that the company does try and do things. I think they need to make sure they're out there like, checking in on people and like really paying attention to work performance from individuals because like in times like this, you need to cut people a little more slack. You're, you're evaluated on a different scale because like now your HR department has a better idea of like what's going on in your situation because like a big part of your situation is you're mostly at home almost all the time. In terms of making it fun, a big thing, a big part we're missing right now is like the ability to get to know your coworkers in a non-professional setting and being able to joke around and like, you know, loosen your tie. Like it helps, uh, it, it helps make that team, you know, those are, those are real things and those matter. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I do think like, especially if there's new people, you need to, you need to take a lot of care to make sure that they like when they do go into the office, if you're doing a hundred percent remote role, when you do go into the office, like people have to like already know who you are and you have to know who people are. Otherwise it's like you have two first days at a company, really try your best to integrate people into the company as well as possible virtually and like take those steps. Jacob, thank you so much for taking time out of, I'm sure you're a very busy day to come and speak with us today. I think we, uh, speaking for all of us, I think we all really enjoyed hearing what you had to say and just some really great advice that you gave about just work life balance and just making sure like it's you, everyone has their own path that they can take. It doesn't have to be a traditional path and you can do so much with a hospitality degree. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>